Welcome back everyone to Digging Deeper. I'm Casey Fitzpatrick and this is my fourth week bringing you videos that revolve around creation and how they relate to the Bible. A lot of what we have talked about is how science has been trying to replace God in creation. This week is much like that as well. We will be looking at geology, which is the study of the origin, history, and structure of the earth commonly associated with the study of rocks. So when it comes to geology, it became well established and more popular as a science in the late 1700s, when it became its own field of study. Once again, we see a fairly new area of study that held to an original belief that God had created the earth and that the biblical accounts of the Bible, such as Noah's flood, are factual, which isn't so much the case anymore. Now, there's a bit of controversy as to the events of Noah's flood, but like I've stated before, scientists uh, prior to the 18th century supported the biblical creation and the events portrayed. They didn't question these things. So this new age of uniformitarianism has been attempting to discredit the Bible at a scientific level. Specifically, and for today's video, we'll be looking at the fossil record and the rock layers as these two go together. So the fossil record has always been one of the leading pieces of evidence in recent time that scientists have used to prove that the earth is millions of years old. And in doing so, they dismiss Noah's flood. They continue to use these, the idea of uniformitarianism, which suggests that they can use current obs observable changes to then predict past events. And they use this when it comes to the different rock layers and where different fossils are found in each layer. So I'm going to draw a little bit of a diagram or picture here for you guys. So imagine this as the ocean floor. And the idea here is that there's different layers of rock or strata as it's referred to. And they suggest that these layers are laid down over long periods of time and they can range in thickness and size and everything else so just imagine these are different that these are the different rock layers that uh, you could find in the uh, on the ocean floor so I think I read somewhere that these were laid a quarter of an inch every year is the assumed amount uh, so then they, they point to some fossils that would be contained in each layer as usually following the sequence of the fossil record. And when I say fossil record, it's usually seen as this diagram where they sort the different fossils almost vertically in groups based, uh, based on how old they are. So meaning that they usually find the younger fossils, such as the fish, and these higher, more recent layers and then as you go down in these layers you would find these older uh, they say more older uh, fossils such as uh, snails or even just clams I guess that's a clam we'll say that's a clam so this idea of the fossil record where they group it from oldest to youngest usually uh, remains true based on how they were laid but it's overly exaggerated when they use the idea of millions of years, so their time scales are way off. And we'll apply some practical knowledge surrounding that. And one of, the, one of the most common things that we see in here is that it takes millions of years for these rock layers to form, which is how geologists now calculate the, the age of the Earth, or one of the ways that they calculate the age of the Earth. But I have a demonstration for you guys. Uh, I have some dirt here, some soil here, some different types of rocks, some different types of earth. Uh, we've got small rock, we've got sand, and then we've got topsoil that I just dug up from home. So when we'll f what I did is I filled this container about three quarters of the way with uh, water. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna scoop this mixture of rocks, sand, soil, and any other material that was in it into this container, which is gonna be loud and messy here. 
get the hands dirty a little bit. And what this is representing is those different uh, layers or the different sediments and compositions of rock that you may find. So you'll, you'll find different, like if you think of the Grand Canyon, you always see those different layers of, of rock. You always see those lines in the, in the side of the mountains there. And this is just one way that we're representing it. So the, this demonstration is pretty much me just strictly being creative and giving you guys a visual tool for the lesson today. But the premise is still there. So let's imagine, I'll clean off my uh, workspace here. Let's imagine the, the global flood. And we know that it rained for 40 days. Uh, Genesis 7.11 says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. So this also tells us that the waters came up from the deep, from the ocean bottoms. So imagine that these, this is the ocean floor. Imagine that these, the water just came straight up this way. So this, this movement of the water coming rushing up from the bottom through the ocean floor would cause this great force and it would cause all these different rock layers and all these different sediments to then be picked up and tossed about into the ocean. And it would mix, so I almost forgot about my demonstration here, so make sure my lid's on tight. So we've got all these different types of soil in here and I'm just gonna give it a good mix just to demonstrate these waters coming up and then mixing as we go. And immediately you can start to see this stuff settle and these uh, rock layers form. So as the ocean currents raced, it would pick up and send all these large deposits of sediments and marine life. So any, so imagine, ignore these, just imagine that you had just marine life in the oceans here. So it would pick up all the rocks, all the sediment, all these fish or marine life, and it would mix it all up, and then the ocean currents would then pull them and take them away. And during the uh, flood, it would travel. It was a global uh, catastrophe, so it happened worldwide. And then what, what we're going to see here is that uh, these layers begin to separate, but not in millions of years. And to save time, I did this before I started recording, just to give you guys a, uh, a better visual, because this is a little cloudy right now. But it definitely did not take millions of years. And I've got them here. I'm going to walk up to you guys. Let that focus a little bit. And as you can see, you can see these different layers of sediments. There's even some stuff on top there. But you can see the different colors. Let me move my hand. Yeah, so you can see these colors that form in different layers. All within, you know, I only did this like an hour or two ago. And even this one, I don't know if you can see it all the way back there, but you've already got different colors that form all the way out, and then the, the cloudiness is beginning to go away as well, and we'll leave that there for you guys to look at. But this didn't take, and this is just a demonstration, but it doesn't take long for these things to happen, for this uh, sediment to settle once it's not being mixed up and tossed about. So each one of these layers would represent different rock types. And even during the flood, uh, all these mixtures, if you had the right amount of different sediments and different you know, compositions of rocks and you're adding pressure because of the because of the water weight from the top and then you can even add heat from different volcanic eruptions that would happen they would form other types of stone as well other types of rocks and different rock layers and that's where we kind of see that variety there as well but here here's where i present to you guys uh, some evidence it's fairly simple but it commonly gets passed over you can find these same rock layers and types of rocks, so like I showed you guys, you can find the same makeup, the same layering, the same composition. You can find these everywhere, the same exact ones. I'll give you an example. The limestone that is found in the Grand Canyon can be found. So take this for example. This is the limestone found in the Grand Canyon. It can be found all across the U.S. and all across the world. It actually can be found in the Appalachian Mountain Range. 
but then it can be found across the globe. It can be found in Ireland, England, and even the Himalayas, which is Mount Everest. Mount Everest is part of the Himalayas. So you've got the same rock layers represented all around the world. And I mixed up quite a few of these and they all look relatively the same. I mean, it was all the same dirt, but they, they mix up and then they settle in similar fashions. And then that is represented across the world because it was a global flood. We, Noah's time was a global flood and it was all over the world. So in that flood, that global catastrophe took place, swept across the earth, carrying rocks and sediment. So this brings me to the fossil record because you can't really investigate these rock layers without those fossils that we find in current uh, geology. So along with the same lines of finding the same Grand Canyon limestone across the globe, you can see the same trend with fossils. We find them everywhere. So marine life fossils are the most abundant in these because the waters rushed up from the deep and carried inland. So much so that 95% of the fossils that we have identified are marine invertebrates, like the snails, clams, or trilobites. And from these containers, we can see that the sediment has already settled incredibly fast and does not take much time to produce those layers. So these layers do not take much time to produce and form. Layers where those fossils can be found due to the abundance of sediment and the destruction of all life because of the flood. So Genesis 7.21 says this, Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, and the creatures that swarm over the earth, and all mankind. Or some translations say all flesh died. So there are millions of logged fossils and then there's trillions more that are beneath us due to the catastrophic events that was the flood. And the different rock types found across the earth contain these marine invertebrates. The 95% of what we find in fossils are those marine invertebrates. Now, have you ever thought about the fossil record as a recording of death? Not that life lived millions of years ago, but a record of death because the fossil record shows significant signs of a catastrophic event. Because you, you can cut open most any sedimentary rocks and look at a cross section and see countless uh, more marine invertebrates in them, perfectly preserved. And geologists agree that under normal circumstances, fossilization is rare. So current uh, observations of fossilization is rare to come by. And they also agree that a sudden death and a rapid burial under large deposits are required for the well preservation of the fossils that we see today. So I found this pretty neat through my research here, is that there are some fossils out there that are preserved at the perfect time. So one of them was a dolphin giving birth. It was uh, over six feet long, and it was fossilized at the moment that it was giving birth. There's a picture, you can probably look it up on the web. And then I also came across a fossil where a fish was just about to have its dinner and it had another small fish halfway in its mouth and halfway out of its mouth. And, but without rapid burial, dead animals would have decomposed or they would have been eaten by scavengers. And then studies even show us that bacteria alone can rapidly disintegrate soft animals. So take our demonstration here into account because during the flood, you had all this junk in the water you had all this uh, sediment, and then you had all the marine life above it that got tossed into this mix. So, and it, we've seen that it settles rapidly, and the burying and preservation of those fossils would have happened as well, because it just would have sunk to the bottom and grabbed everything along with it. So because this is, this is just a small example, but imagine miles upon miles of this thick sediment mix just grabbing everything as it fell to the ground. So, and then I was looking at another study uh, that kind of put it in perspective for modern times that showed that thin shells, so like uh, seashells or snail shells, are just as likely to be found fossilized as thicker ones. So they found thin shells and thicker shells kind of at the same frequency within the uh, 
uh, fossil record from layers of the sedimentary rock. They found the same amount, typically. You're just as likely to find one as you are the other, which means that uh, because current fossilization, like observed today, would kind of favor thicker shells because it would take longer for them to decompose. So, and they don't decay as quickly, so there's a better chance of them not being picked up by scavengers or being floated away or just decomposing in general. But this isn't the case because we can, like I said, you find the same amount, you have the same amount of chance to find a thick one versus a thin one. So there's no evidence of this, uh, you're more likely to find a thick shell than a thin shell. Because it would take years for these animals or these marine invertebrates to be buried without the flood-like conditions. So the fossilization of an animal, such as a fish or other marine life, is incredibly delicate and it requires a rapid burial that can be caused by a catastrophic event such as a flood. Uh, one other piece of evidence <clears throat> excuse me, that I'd like to go over is the eruption of Mount St. Helens. And I'll just brush over this, but it's really cool, so I want you guys to get this. It's a more recent example of a catastrophic event. So this happened about uh, 40 years ago, so May 18th, 1980 was in the eruption of Mount St. Helens, and this is often regarded as one of the most significant geologic events of the 20th century. So, and then incredible lessons and, and uh, information has come out of this. The, the eruption of Mount St. Helens triggered several different earth-shaping forces. The original blast of steam was followed by landslides, volcanic ash flowing on the ground, mud flows, steam water, waves on Spirit Lake, and falling volcanic ash. Together, all these produced a complex sediment layers up to 600 feet thick. And then the most surprising accumulations resulted from several slurries of volcanic ash that moved out from the volcano, mostly at velocities estimated at up to 80 miles per hour, and the resulting deposits contain sequences of multiple layers, including many fine volcanic ash beds ranging in thickness from tiny fractions of an inch to some as three feet thick. So you had really thin layers and then you had really thick layers that were laid down by the same volcanic ash. And this would be laid down in just a few seconds in several minutes. So one such layer deposited was 25 feet thick and it accumulated in a, in a time frame of three hours on the evening of June 12, 1980. Uh, this information is coming from the Answers in Genesis website, in case you're curious. So it came from volcanic ash that flows moving at a hurricane velocity speed at 90 miles per hour. And geologists were staggered that so many varied sediment layers, both fine and coarse, contain thin horizontal, horizontal layers cross bedding and graded bedding uh, could be produced by a slurry moving at more than freeway speed. So you had this fast moving volcanic ash that then settled and produced all different types of uh, layers, sediment layers. So Mount St. Helens can emphatically teach us that the sedimentary layering does form very rapidly from catastrophic, catastrophic flow processes, that's a hard word, such as those like Genesis Flood. So this is an example, a real life example, that we can look at in history, recent history, of a catastrophic event that could represent a global catastrophic event like Noah's Flood. So you see this small snapshot of what the Genesis Flood could have produced at a much larger caliber. So, because the processes are essentially the same. So I thought that was a neat recent study that we could, that was relevant to what we are talking about. So last week, we brought up having a biblical perspective. So when we, especially when we talk about those difficult questions, because I did get a question that we talked about last week, so I thought we could apply the same principle of how we answered that question to this material today. So to kind of wrap things up, I wanna walk us through what it means to have a biblical perspective on the rock layers and fossil records. But first, let's make sense of it, because that's always a good starting point, is to make sense of it at the beginning. So fossilization is a process, like we talked about, that is very rare to be observed today under those natural circumstances. So applying, so uniformitarianism applies that the present is the key to the past. 
This faces real problems when it comes to the vast number of fossils. Therefore, a flood, a catastrophic global flood, makes sense of the evidence here. Because fossilization currently is not observed at the caliber that we find it today. And it's not easily uh, replicated without the events of a catastrophic uh, flood. So there's only a small percentage of fossils that could be dated pre-flood. Now, we can look at the order of those fossils in the rock layers in which they are found. The geological record shows that marine life was buried first, hence why it is lower on those rock layers. So this is where we talked about that fossil record, that chart where it talks about youngest to oldest and how it kind of, it does correlate, but their numbers were off and we'll see why. So it's not until further up in these rock layers that we see land dwelling animals. But if we read the flood account that we read in Genesis 7:11, we can see that the flood almost started in the ocean. So the last half of that verse says this, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. So when I read this, it kind of sparked interest in my head because I questioned, I was curious whether it meant that the one event happened before the other event. So it said the, the springs of the great deep burst forth. So that's the ocean waters coming up. And that's where we talked about how the, got, everything got mixed up. And then it says, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. So I think it's, as I thought about it, I was like, well, it kind of really doesn't matter because even if the flood started in the ocean or not, like one started before the other, I think it's reasonable to see that the effects of the flood would have started in the ocean. So we would have seen uh, flooding happen more quickly because of the ocean levels rising versus then the heavens, it, it, let me read it so I don't misquote it, and the floodgates of the heaven were open. So you'd have this influx of uh, water from the oceans mixing up that sediment, mixing up, grabbing all the marine life, the marine invertebrates here, and then going inland with it, and then it would have settled over time, and then it would have had the uh, mammals and animals up top in that mix as it came to land. Let me scroll back down to where it was. So it would make pretty, pretty good sense that the marine life would be buried first. So we had pictures of the snails and the clams and trilobites down lower, and then you would have vertebrate animals and mammals towards the top. So they were picked up and swept inland, buried in that sediment. And we see the evidence of the oceans flooding over continents because we have sedimentary rocks containing fossils that stretch over large areas over continents and are also found in the same areas. Like we talked about that limestone in the Grand Canyon can be found in the Grand Canyon, but it also can be found in the Himalayas and Mount Everest. So through simple demonstration here, we see that the sediments will fall quickly and form those layers. So I really, I really like the challenge that last week's question presented and the importance of how we address uh, some of those questions. So perspective is crucial and we see that once again here today. So that's all that I have for you guys. I've got some, some cleanup work to do here, but I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, next week, I have something special for you guys. We're actually be filming in Virginia, and I'll send you guys a video that way next week. So look forward for that. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out and ask me. But this has been a great time. Appreciate it. Have a good day.